You have an essay due for English in less than a week. Where to start? This video will walk you through exactly how to write your expository essay for English class, share a few tips to help writing that essay become a little bit easier, and some things to think about when writing an essay in the future, either for English class or social studies or whatever class you may be in. So first, don't panic. We're going to break down the writing process into a few sections to help make writing this essay a bit simpler. Let's get started by looking at the handout you were given for your essay. We want to look for the prompt and also the grading information given to you in advance by your teacher. So here's the basic information on the essay that you'll be writing. Notice the things that your teacher has either bolded or underlined, as these are hints from your teacher about what she wants you to pay attention to. So right off the bat, we see that this is going to be an informational research essay. This tells us a couple things about how the paper should be written. In an informational essay or an expository essay, you're not going to be using first-person pronouns. So no I, me, my, myself, we, us, or our. And you're not going to be using second person, so no you, your, yours, yourself. And because it says research essay right here, we know that you're going to need to do some outside research on your topic. Scrolling down, you're going to notice also there are a few other things that are bolded. So we see that this paper should discuss the basic background, setting, and plot of the text that you have chosen to read for your SSR book. So you're going to be pulling information from your SSR book. And then also, you are going to be using your research, your outside research on a cultural tradition and connecting that to the book. Let's look now at the prompt. We'll get back to the basics in just a minute. But if you look at the prompt, the prompt tells you what you're going to be writing about. So it says, explain how your chosen cultural tradition, meaning the one that you are presenting in class, is important to your SSR book. Explain the significance of the practice of that tradition. And then in bold, why is this tradition important to the culture? That's your research. That's the thing that your teacher wants you to focus on. And also, why is that tradition important to the author? So this essay, you can already tell because the two questions are bolded, really has two parts. One is that you're going to be researching outside of your SSR book a cultural tradition. And two, connecting that research back to the book to show why it's important to the author. If we go back and look at the basics, we see that this essay is going to be three to four pages double spaced. And again, notice informational essay is highlighted, meaning no first person pronouns, spell out your contractions. It must use MLA formatting. So again, like other essays you have likely done, one inch margins, 11 to 12 point font, you have to have the running header at the top, the correct information, all of which you can find in your MLA Made Simple Guide. A works cited page with a minimum of two scholarly sources, meaning outside research that you have done, in addition to your SSR novel. This right here tells you that your works cited page needs to have at least three sources on it, at least two outside research pieces, and your SSR novel. So those will be on your work cited. You're also going to need to have parenthetical citations within your essay, meaning any time that you have pulled information, it must have a parenthetical citation at the end. And then you need to have at least one direct quote from your SSR novel. That's a lot. But notice that your teacher has also given you a basic outline for putting together this essay, which should make it easy. So you're going to start with an attention getting device. This is sometimes what we also like to call the hook. You're going to have background information, meaning you're going to need to give us a little bit of background on who the author is, a basic about what the plot is, and a basic about what the story is about. You're going to give us a little bit of an introduction into a cultural tradition, and then you'll lead to your thesis. And again, remember, your thesis has to address these two questions. So there are a couple of examples that you have in your handout. One, the cultural tradition of milk to the Dinka is symbolic of many cultural specific beliefs, traditions, and values. Now notice the cultural significance of milk, which is the tradition 
is symbolic of many cultural specific beliefs, traditions, and values. So it mentions the specific tradition and how it's important. Another way of doing that, in the second example, the significant rite of passage of marriage, okay, so it mentions, the thesis mentions the tradition that's being researched, is especially important to the author Adeline Yen Ma in the novel Falling Leaves. This one does almost a better job than this first example up here because it specifically mentions the book and the author. So it directly connects the tradition, in this case, the rite of passage of marriage, to the book itself. So example two is probably a more solid example of a thesis statement. Last, the tests that the Dalai Lama must pass in order to be officially installed as the leader of Tibet so again, there's the cultural tradition, had a significant impact upon the 14th Dalai Lama, as can be seen in the memoir, Freedom in Exile. Again, notice the book titles right there. So this, the last two examples, directly answer these two questions. They're probably even a better example than this thesis one. And then ultimately, you'll end up with body paragraphs that do two things. One is that it's going to show us how your cultural tradition is seen and used in the SSR book. And then two, how we, a bit of history and a bit of research about that cultural tradition. So these are items that might be included in the body. But what I want you to do is think about breaking your body paragraphs into two. One of those body paragraphs is going to be about how that cultural tradition is seen in the book and about its significance. And then another body paragraph is really going to include that outside research. How is that cultural tradition significant? What is the meaning of it? What are the steps of it? Essentially, it's what you've presented in your pre SSR presentation to the class. And then last but not least is the conclusion for the essay. Now, be careful because the conclusion is not just repeating everything that you've already said in the essay. Instead, well-written conclusions are those that put the thesis into different words, review the main point, and then end with a clincher. And a clincher is sort of like a hook. You want to start strong and end strong. So a clincher is kind of coming full circle in the essay, and it's moving that essay forward. Why is this an important topic? What is so significant about this cultural tradition? Why should we know it? Why should we remember it? So you have to end strong. Let's take a look at an example essay, and hopefully you'll see these pieces start to come together, and we'll break it up into its simple parts. So here's an SSR essay that was turned in last year, and I've changed the name of the student to protect the identity. This one's a pretty good essay. You'll notice this essay has the running header as it should. It's set up exactly as it should be, meaning that you have the name, the teacher's name, the course name, and then the date so that it's listed day, month, year. Everything is double spaced. The title is centered. It's not bolded. It's not underlined. It's the same as the font. So in terms of formatting, this is a perfect piece. Now, right off the bat, I could tell a couple of things about this essay. One is this title. That is a boring title. I could do something more creative than that, and I hope you do too. The other thing, though, is I love this start right here, this first sentence. That captures my attention. March 23rd, 1991. That's a perfect hook. And it's perfect because it captures my attention because it's not a sentence. It's kind of just a date hanging out there. But that's okay because it does exactly what I need it to do. It hooks me in as a reader. I want to know what's so significant about March 23rd, 1991. Why is this date starting out this essay? That's an effective hook. So starting out with a date or a fact is a great way to start. You could also start with a startling statistic. You could start with an interesting quote to sort of lead us into what your essay is about. Those are all fantastic ways to start your essay. There are a couple of no-nos. So a couple of things to avoid. Avoid starting with a definition. It's very contrived and it's very rarely done well. Avoid starting with a rhetorical question. Where have all the children gone? It just sounds sort of immature. And avoid starting with a quotation that doesn't directly connect with your thesis. You need to make sure if you're going to start with a quotation that you introduce who the author of that quote is and you integrate it well into your piece. 
So let's keep going with this essay. Take a look at what else this essay does well. The rebels in Sierra Leone attempted to overthrow the government of Joseph Muma. Now notice a couple of things that work really well right here is I get a bit of background about what's going on in Sierra Leone. This gives me an idea of what this paper is going to be about. And because this information wasn't known by the student ahead of time, I've got a citation that's done correctly. I know that when this student looked up this fact, he found it from an article, and I could tell that because it's in quotes, and that that article didn't have an author listed. You always put inside the quotations the author's last name, but if you can't find the author, you use what comes next in line in the work cited, and in this case it's going to be the article title. This initial conflict erupted into an 11-year-long war, taking the lives of 50,000 citizens of Sierra Leone and creating a devastating demand for child soldiers by both the rebels and the Sierra Leonean forces. Fantastic! That's background information. It gives me a little bit of background about what's going on. And then what I should see next is a connection to the text. At the young age of 12, Ishmael Bia. There it is. There's my connection to a long way gone. Was forced out of his home village in Magbuemo because the rebels raided and destroyed his village. He is then forced to travel throughout the country to find shelter and food with his friends and older brother. Again, now I've got background on the book. The significance of child soldiers is particularly important to Ishmael Bia in his memoir, A Long Way Gone. That is a solid thesis, and it's solid because it introduces the cultural tradition, child soldiers, and I've got the author's name and the book title. That's a well done introduction. The only thing that I might ask this student to consider is I have no transition sentence here, which would lead me to the next paragraph. So I might instead have that student add one little sentence, something to the effect of, um, the life of a child soldier, especially that of Ishmael Bias, especially that of Bias, was particularly difficult. And what that does is it tells me that that next paragraph is going to focus on Ishmael Bia's experience. That's a subtle transition into what comes next. And then I should see, and I do, that the next paragraph, the first body paragraph, is a paragraph about Ishmael Bia and about his specific experiences of being a child soldier. Within that body paragraph, I notice, and I can see right away without even really reading through it, that I've got a direct quote from the book, and I want to see that. Now, I also notice that with this direct quote, I have an introduction to it. The student has set up where that quotation comes from. In fact, whether it's from your SSR book or whether it's from your research, I want you to remember ICE. ICE stands for I for integrate. C for sight, and E for explain. And it's a good rule of thumb when you're using direct quotations. You want to make sure that you integrate your quote by adding a tag, either to introduce it or to set the context of it. You also need to make sure that you cite it, like this person did. We have a citation right here with the author's last name, Bea, and the page number. And then you need to explain it. Why is this quotation significant? And this person did that. Bea uses fire as a symbol for new beginnings, being thrown into the fire. And look, it explains the quote. Later on in this paragraph, he then connects how that quotation shows about Bea's experience as a child soldier. That connects back to the thesis. That's what your first body paragraph should do. Your first body paragraph should introduce what your tradition is as it is seen in the SSR book. Give a quote from the SSR book that connects to the tradition and then explains how that tradition is significant to the author. That then leads into more research that should come from outside of the text. So in the second body paragraph, or the third paragraph overall in the essay, I should have more information about the tradition being presented. Now, given what your tradition is, you may actually have found quite a bit of research. So you can expand 
the second body paragraph into multiple paragraphs, which is exactly what this person has done here. So you'll notice that this essay is actually a bit longer, but it's because they've done more outside research on what the life of a child soldier in Sierra Leone is all about. And that's fine to do. Most of you, however, will probably only have a four paragraph essay, which is just fine. But if you do want to include some more of that research that you found so that your essay becomes five or six paragraphs, that is okay as well. What you'll notice in the body paragraphs of this essay that include the research is that it does so by connecting back to the author. So we've got Ishmael Bio was just one of 300,000 child soldiers worldwide fighting in over 50 armed conflicts. So this is a transition sentence. We know from the first sentence here that we're going to learn more about the life of child soldiers. Notice it's cited too. And it's cited because it contains a statistic. The student who wrote this paper didn't know that there were 300,000 child soldiers worldwide until he looked it up. So although it's not a direct quote, because he had to look up that information, it must have a parenthetical site at the end. That's the rule of thumb. Remember, if you had to look it up, then you have to cite it. The other thing to keep in mind too is sometimes you will have direct quotes that you want to use that are a little bit longer. And that's fine, but you need to make sure that they're cited correctly. So this right here is an example of what we call a block quote. Any quote that you want to use that's over four lines long is going to get indented and it becomes almost like a little mini paragraph of its own. Its citation actually looks a little bit different too. Notice. The way that we generally cite is that the period goes after the parentheses for the parenthetical cite. But in a block quote, which is for direct quotes that are over four lines long, the period will go inside the quotation and then the next sentence will actually start without the indentation. What this does is it shows us the larger quote in the context of a paragraph. So this is technically one paragraph. It's a continuation. But because the quotation here is longer, it gets indented so it almost looks like its own piece. For more information on the block quote, you have directions and examples in your MLA Made Simple Guide. So if you have a quote that's over four lines long, you'll want to take a look at it. The other thing that this particular direct quote highlights is that when you have a quote within a quote, as we do here, the quote within the quotation that you're using, you've directly taken it from a book or an article, you need to put the quote inside that into single quotes. Again, you'll find more information in your MLA Made Simple Guide. What I do want to point out here, though, is that for all of the quotes that we have in this essay, whether they're taken from the SSR book or whether they're taken from another source as this one is, what follows is an explanation of that quote and why it's significant to the topic or the tradition, in this case, child soldiers. And that's what you must make sure that you have. Once you've thoroughly explored how the tradition is in your SSR book and explored research on that topic, that'll lead you to your conclusion. Notice here at the end of his essay, we have a bit of a summation of the research. Although recruiting and using child soldiers for an armed fight is inhumane and morally unjust, it has become a backbone of Sierra Leone's cultural traditions. So it kind of connects back to and sums up how the tradition of child soldiers is found in Sierra Leone. This then leads to a conclusion, the first sentence of which should be a restatement of the thesis. Ishmael Bia was one of many children involved in the war as a child soldier from a very young age and has affected him, unfortunately that's the wrong affected, it should have an A on it, affected him in unimaginable ways. And that's a restatement of the thesis. Remember, the thesis connected Ishmael Bia, the author of the book, to the tradition. Now, that's not saying it exactly as it was said before, and you shouldn't. Remember, conclusions should not simply be regurgitating everything you've already done in the essay. Instead, it's restating it. It's moving it forward. So then the next sentence is not just going to be, in this essay, I have explored. 
That's too contrived. Notice his conclusion paragraph doesn't start with in conclusion, which again, too contrived. I don't want to see that. I know it's the conclusion. Clearly, there are no paragraphs that follow it. So instead, you want to make sure that you come up with a bit of a summation, but it moves moves the idea forward. So we've got, he was forced to become one of his homeland's aggressive cultural traditions of recruiting child soldiers. And again, that sums up sort of what the essay is about, but it says it in a very strong way. Now let's see how he did with his clincher sentence, that last sentence. Does this help us remember what the essay is about? The significance of child soldiers is highly important in a long way gone because Ishmael Bia was one of them. Oh, boo! He started so strong with this essay. He started with a date. It captured our attention. This just restates the thesis. That's not moving it forward. That's not interesting. What I might have done is instead, because he started with a date, I might have put like if he could find the date that Ishmael Bia was rescued and was no longer a child soldier, that would have been an effective conclusion. If he could maybe have found a statistic about how many children died as a result of being child soldiers. Something like 325,000 soldiers are dead because of Sierra Leone's use of child soldiers. Um, will this happen again? And end with a question. Something more forceful than just the significance of child soldiers is highly important to a long way gone. Well, we know that. You've said it as a thesis. You've actually already said it right here. That's kind of a letdown in terms of a clincher. You want to end strong. So this essay would probably lose points because it doesn't have an effective clincher. Notice, however, what it does well is I don't have the work cited hanging out at the bottom of this page. The work cited is on a page all by itself, as it should be. This is a well-formatted work cited page. I've got the running header up here at the top. I have got entries that are alphabetized, so B, S, W, so they're alphabetized. Each entry, if it's longer than one line, is indented for the second and other lines, which is exactly as it should be. Each entry ends with a period, as it should. Um, if there was no author listed, then I have the article title, which comes first. That's perfect. The only problems I see right now are for titles of books or titles of magazines. Those should be italicized. So there was something he would lose points for here. But otherwise, this all can be done for you through use of NoodleBib. The thing to keep in mind is that the only thing that goes on the work cited are those entries that you have used directly, that you have parenthetical cites for in your essay. If you didn't use it in your essay, it doesn't belong on your work cited. So not everything that you have listed in NoodleBib for this SSR project will belong on your work cited because likely you have not used every single one of those articles in writing your essay. Only those things that you use in your essay belong here. And I should absolutely make sure that I see your SSR book listed on your work cited. If you have questions about putting together your work cited, again, refer to your MLA Made Simple Guide.